to say people have also asked me, but can't you make some kind of a fingerprint just based upon when the jamming occurs? Uh, the answer to this would be yes. But uh, our technique for that is essentially if you occasionally also throw in a jamming signal when there doesn't need to be one, <laughs> you can actually throw in uh, some chaff with the wheat. So it actually makes it harder for an attacker then to be able to try and make fingerprints uh, on what tags are, uh, are there based upon uh, what time slots are being jammed. So, but once again, this is still a work in progress and it's a cat and mouse game like anything else. So uh, RFID reader query jamming. This is not yet public. This is not yet online. I'm just, you guys are hearing, uh, hearing it first here. Um, our, how, do we how, do we how do we jam now RFID reader queries? I mean, with RFID tag jamming, that's only effective because if uh, you're doing things like read queries. So, or if you, for example, if you want to ask which RFID tags are here, and then your passport says, hi, I'm here, it, you know, j blocking the tag response is useful. If you ask, okay, passport, could you please send me, you know, some of the data groups so I can see, uh, you know, what your fingerprints look like, <laughs> you're essentially sending a, a read data block. <laughs> And then uh, when you block it on the way back, that's also useful because it can't uh, get your fingerprints or whatnot. However, uh, RFID uh, uh, tag response jamming is not useful for things like write qu queries. If you want to write data to a tag, I mean, there is no response that you can block on the way back. <laughs> so uh, essentially what you actually need to do is intercept the RFID reader query uh, as it's outgoing. And, uh, and other kinds of queries where you need to in intercept the outbound RFID reader query are for things like kill tag commands. Because of course, once you deactivate a tag, it's dead. So you need to catch it before, uh, before it actually hits the RFID tag that you're, uh, for example, trying to DOS. <laughs> so, Here's how we do it. Uh, you have RFID uh, frames. Uh, RFID, just like anything else, it's, uh, us they usually have start, start a frame, you know, bits, checksum, end a frame. So what we do is when the start a frame and you know, the bits come in, we basically take a look at it and then decide you know, what is the RFID reader trying to do. Is it writing data? Is it writing data to uh, a tag that I care about? Maybe I don't want uh, data to be written to this particular tag. Then what we do is, uh, using an access control list, um, we basically specify if somebody's trying to write data to my, or if somebody's trying to kill you know, an EPC tag on, I don't know, my you know, microwavable spinach or something that I want to be able to automatically set the time for my microwave. Or, you know, they come up with these use, useless applications. Anyway, so but the point is if you decide that uh, you don't want the tag <laughs> to be written to or deactivated, you put that in your access control list. And then what we do is we actually send out yet again another one of these random jamming signals uh, during the CRC and the end of frame. So, I mean, a lot of people would ask, you know, this stuff is real time. Can you actually make that decision fast enough and react fast enough to be able to garble the CRC and end of frame? The answer is yes, we've done it. So we basically filter these outbound RFID reader queries. So as you can see here, uh, here's the start of frame. Here's a whole bunch of bits. And then here uh, is when the uh, CRC starts. So we have a callback that then starts the jamming. And it jams essentially through uh, the uh, CRC through the end of frame. And indeed, the tag, uh, because the CRC doesn't check out and because the end of frame makes it an invalid frame because there is no end of frame anymore, the RFID tag then ignores the query that was sent by the reader. So in such a way, the RFID guardian is really a man in the middle between RFID reader communications and RFID tag communications. Even though it's a broadcast medium, we really can filter things going both ways. Okay, so you're starting to see the primitives with which the RFID guardian works. Tag spoofing, tag jamming, and RFID reader query jamming. So, what do you do once you have something that can filter RFID communications? Well, our first thought was, why don't we try to build a firewall with this? So, for real. So the RFID guardian, uh, in terms of a privacy protection device, actually can act like an RFID firewall. So the major features, uh, you can take one of these things and you can use it either to protect individual people or to protect individual locations. Of course, you need a battery uh, if it's going to be on a person. Like I was saying, clipping on the belt. We'd like to do this with, uh, with a guardian too. Keeping in mind that the only tags that are protected by this firewall are the, are the tags within the immediate radio operational range of the guardian. So a lot of people say, yeah, but what if you have uh, a jacket and you put your jacket on the chair and then walk away? You know, then it's, it's game over. 
over, you know, for the jacket because, you know, once you walk away from it, it's not in the range of the guardian anymore, so it's not protected anymore. But these are the rules of the game, and you know, if you want to use the guardian, this is one of its limitations. We can't do anything about this. However, you could also put one of these things in your living room. So then, uh, as long as you're, you know, in your living room, then perhaps uh, it would work. Or, in fact, at some point, maybe you could coordinate multiple of these things. Well, I mean, this is future research, but. Uh, so what are its main functions? Well, first of all, auditing. So RFID activity is just radio. It's invisible. If people are querying your passport, how are you going to know? It's not like you have this little LED on your passport that you know, turns on every time somebody's scanning it. It's not like it has a little built-in speaker so it can say, you know, help me, you know, every time an attacker <laughs> is trying to scan it. The point is, this stuff is invisible. What we want to do is we want to make RFID activity, first of all, just like a packet filter on a network. I mean, think uh, TCP dump. We actually want to try and make a kind of TCP dump <laughs> for RFID. So essentially, if there are RFID uh, reader queries, remember, we can intercept them. And because we're capable of uh, full RFID communications as both a tag and a reader, we can actually understand the reader queries, which means we can uh, receive them, uh, essentially uh, extract the information about what is the RFID reader trying to do. You can then filter the information based upon whether or not that's interesting to you, and you can log it. So if, let's say, they pass some legislation, let's say in, in Europe, saying that, uh, you know, well, there's this you know, privacy directive thing, uh, essentially saying if any uh, per personal information is being gathered on you, you have to be informed. So, you know, what, what if, you know, you purchased uh, something from the Metro Future Store <laughs> in Germany? And uh, what if they didn't post a sign saying that they were performing uh, RFID queries, perhaps even on the items that you just purchased? You know, they're breaking the law. The question is, how do consumers have any kind of legal recourse if the company is playing against the rules? Because right now, I mean, consumers just don't know because they can't see the RFID activity. But with something like an RFID guardian, granted not everybody's going to carry one of these things, but if you have a few gearheads that do, <laughs> if enough of them notice that this particular store is misbehaving, then they can go ahead and perhaps go to the Chamber of Commerce and complain and actually get the store in trouble for their misbehavior. So this really is about putting some power back in the hands of the people here. Uh, also, you can audit RFID tags, by the way. So if, for example, somebody gives you an extra RFID tag, let's say you left your home first thing in the morning and you had one RFID tag. You return back at home at the end of the day, and now you have two. The question is, you know, where did that second RFID tag come from? Did somebody slip it in your backpack when you weren't looking? So you know, when did you get it, for example? You know, could you get maybe a timestamp showing when you received the second RFID tag? Well, the point is if the RFID tag is compatible with the RFID guardian, yes, of course, this only works if it's at a compatible standard and a compatible frequency to the RFID guardian. Once again, our system does have its limitations. But as long as they're using tags that the RFID guardian knows how to deal with, you can actually log when that tag was received. And once again, it puts a little bit more transparency into uh, RFID activity in the world. Key management. So some RFID tags do have security features. I was talking about a lot of the really good research that other people are doing in this field with on-tag crypto, things like you know, sleep and wake modes for RFID tags, security protocols. But anytime you start getting into these on-tag security features, you start having data that's required, secret keys. I mean, how can you kill you know, an RFID tag without having its uh, kill password? Because if you didn't have a kill password, then anybody could randomly go killing your tags. Same thing with sleep and, sleep and wake. You're probably gonna have a sleep, sleep password, and you're also probably gonna have a wake, a wake key. Same thing with the tags that do crypto. <laughs> uh, RFID sect is a company, uh, well, they got a little bit lambasted by, by Bruce Schneier for using uh, proprietary crypto, but regardless, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are some crypto tags that are available. They also have uh, secret keys that you use for the cryptography. So the question is, when you acquire these tags in the first place, how do you get the keys? How do you manage them? <laughs> how do you use them? I mean, let's say I go shopping. Let's say I go to a supermarket and I buy an RFID tag, uh, an RFID tagged item. 
I mean, maybe I would like to uh, immediately put the tag to sleep, since maybe that tag actually has a sleep function built into it. Well, the fact of the matter is, I need to receive that tag from, the, let's say, the supermarket cash register. And then I need to, uh, on top of that, uh, you know, actually do the, perform the command that puts the tag to sleep. So with the RFID guardian, you could actually perform this key transfer uh, using RFID. Now, how do we do this? And this is also something we have actually already implemented. We do SSL over RFID. <laughs> it is completely ugly and horrible, and the bandwidth sucks, <laughs> really. But it works. So what we actually can do is, on the, on the behalf of the RFID reader, let's say owned by the cash register, they don't actually need any extra hardware to be able to perform. Uh, so essentially, they just use, uh, they can use either public or symmetric key crypto to set up uh, an authenticated session between the cash register and, and the RFID guardian. And it can basically, you know, using SSL over RFID, transfer the keys. And then once the RFID guardian has the keys, then it can use its built-in RFID reader then to put the tag immediately to sleep. So this is uh, another part of what it can do. Access control, this was the whole uh, firewall functionality I was telling you about, and authentication. Once again, not all RFID tags can authenticate themselves. So instead, we have the RFID guardian authenticating the RFID reader on the behalf of the RFID tag. And then it's also, because it's also controlling the access of the RFID tag, then it's almost as if, uh, you know, with the individual tags that they would be uh, controlling their own access. And, and performing the authentication themselves, except for the fact that when you step out of radio, radio range, then it doesn't work anymore. So here's an example access control list. Um, what you're going to see is that it looks a heck of a lot like a standard access control list, except we put it in a kind of pretty bib tech like format, but ignore that. So uh, just uh, here's what the rules look like. So a uh, rule uh, protocol uh, 15693, this is what we have uh, for this particular one. So let's say you want to, uh, by default, we want to leave all RFID traffic alone. That's the first rule, because of course we don't want to interfere with other RFID systems if it doesn't belong to us, because we're really good and benevolent people. But generally, we want to block all queries to R tags. So the second rule might be, I would like to deny any RFID queries that are targeting tags, let's say in a, in a list that I've constructed of ones called TI white. So we have particular tags in our lab that are from Texas Instruments that are little white keychain thingies. So we said, you know, let's just actually block <laughs> all the queries that are going to these tags. So we made a list of, that, of them and the, uh, like a normal, you know, access control list, like you would define, for example, a list of IP addresses, we define a list of RFID tags. Third rule, but we would like to let an RFID reader, let's say, in, that's in the trusted category to be able to access uh, the tags in the group TI White. And what is trusted? Trusted is simply nothing more than a role that is represented by a key. It's just role-based access control, S most standard stuff in the world. You basically just give the RFID readers, let's say, I mean, you, you, I mean, you could have a, a key for readers at home, a single key for readers at the office. I mean, who knows? I mean, Kmart or whatever, Walmart might have an entire PKI, PKI for these things. But essentially, you can make it as simple or as complex as you want in deciding who you want to let access your tags and who can't. So, all right. Uh, I talked about privacy functionality. So, uh, our, actually, our most recent work, and this is the stuff that is really like brand spanking new, is how do we actually also use the RFID guardian for security instead of just for privacy? So, right now, RFID deployers make a lot of stupid mistakes. You want to know, you know more information about stupid mistakes? You heard you know, Lucas's talk earlier today. <laughs> I mean, the fact of the matter is, right now, there, I, I would posit to say there is no RFID security industry. But I think m maybe there should be. <laughs> because right now, governments and companies are making egregious errors. And essentially, <sighs> Okay, part of the problem is you need to slap them upside the head before they do something about it. However, there really also are players out there that have good intentions and really want to fix these problems. I mean, for example, uh, 
I was talking one time with, uh, with, with NIST in, in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and they're busy, they were busy working on a system for something called HSPD-12, which is Homeland Security Presidential Elect, uh, Directive 12. So President Bush, after 9-11, decides you know, he wants to look like he's doing something. <laughs> so what does he do? He, he basically mandates that they have to make a single system for authentication and access control for the entire federal government. Yeah, a little bit important. <laughs> so, I, you know, so I'm talking with, with NIST. They'd actually sent me a copy of their standard. 